So a couple weeks ago, I, I was driving around, getting some stuff ready for the building, and I drove past an, another church, and they had this really nifty sign, uh, the type of sign that costs too much money for us, right? They had this really nifty sign out in front of their church, and it was this big video sign, and it said, He is risen. Now, I love Easter, Yes, partly because I love candy, but I also love Easter. I love the Easter egg hunt. I love to celebrate Easter on church, uh, you know, on Easter morning. And so I got pumped up. I see this sign. I get all pumped up. I'm like, yeah, he is risen. I love seeing that sign. And then I get a couple blocks down the street, and I'm like, dude, it is three weeks until Easter. It's three weeks. What? The, like, you've got this Easter sign. We haven't even made it to Palm Sunday. We haven't even made it to Good Friday, and you're already all the way to Easter. The thing is, Easter is so fun to celebrate that it's really easy to skip the cross for the empty tomb, isn't it? It's really easy to, to skip over the story of Jesus' death that's so difficult to take in. It's so painful. There's so much sorrow involved that it is easy to skip over the cross and get to the empty tomb. I mean, did anyone else notice that they started putting out Easter candy at King Supers in like January, right? You notice that? You go into, it's like the first aisle in my King Supers is all the Easter candy. That stuff has been up there. It's probably expired by this point. It's been up there since January. I mean, the, I did notice though, the Cadbury eggs have not gone under the inflationary pressures that real eggs have gone under. So don't worry, you can still get your Cadbury eggs this year. You don't have to take out a loan like you do for regular eggs. But the point is that it is easy to start celebrating Easter a little early, isn't it? Easter's so fun, it's such a joyful occasion. It's easy to skip right over the cross and get to the empty tomb. But today is Palm Sunday. And what Palm Sunday is, is the day that Jesus decided, today's the day I'm going to put everything in motion for me to die. Because the minute he walked into Jerusalem, everybody knew what he had been preaching across the countryside. And he, as he had gone around the Sea of Galilee, as he had gone through the countryside of Israel, everyone knew that he was saying that he was the Messiah. That he was saying that he was God. And so as he enters Jerusalem, he knows the day I do this, Palm Sunday, the day he walks in and the palm branches are placed down there like we just celebrated with our kids, the day this happens, it is the inauguration. It is placing everything into motion for me to die. Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus was staring down death just days later. So Palm Sunday is this, this, this day that, that, yeah, we reflect on his entering Jerusalem, but we also reflect on his decision to die for us. Because next Sunday is Easter, though. It's easy to jump to Easter. It's easy for us to put that sign up, he is risen three weeks before Easter, and skip right over the cross to the empty tomb, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. We must talk about the cross. We must talk about the death of Jesus. We cannot skip the cross for the empty tomb. So this morning, I have a very different message for you, okay? There's no three points. There's no seven points. I think seven points is the most I've ever done. You'll have to correct me later. There's no clever anything. All I want to do is tell you the story of the cross. Right? right now we're in the second week of three weeks on the life of Mary Magdalene. And so one, one, of my, one of my things, I want to tell you the cross through her eyes. The story of the cross, I want you to, to, to experience the story of the cross through Mary Magdalene's eyes, through her experience. But more than anything, what I've done is I've taken uh, the, the four accounts of the story of Jesus' death and I've, I, I've spliced them, put them together today so you get the most fully orbed view of what happened that day as Jesus went to the cross on Good Friday to die. And so this morning, all I want to do is I want to tell you the story of Jesus' death through her eyes. I want you to experience it. I want you to see it how Mary Magdalene did. And I want you to carry that through this week until you do get to Easter. It's a hard story. It's a story filled with sorrow, and I can't help but to, to be a little uh, uh, conflicted over the juxtaposition between the joy of our first Sunday in this building, the sorrow of the cross. But if you noticed on your way in, this building has a huge cross in front of it, and that's what we're here for, to celebrate the salvation that the cross brings us. There's no point to this if that is not the case. 
And so while it is the difficult story to tell, it is the only story we have to tell this morning. Here's how it begins. Mark chapter 15, verses 16 to 20. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. They began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes. Then they led him out to crucify him. So, there had been a time years before where Mary Magdalene, she was a lost soul. She was racked with trauma. She was possessed by demons. She had this terrible past that she was haunted by. She was at the end of her rope without hope. But then Jesus came to her town of Magdala, and he found her, yes, her, and he healed her, yes, her, the rejected, the forgotten about, the unworthy Mary. He healed her. And so she had decided to follow him. And now for years, every day, she's been following Jesus. Every day she wakes up and follows him and listens to him and watches him work. Even though she had been a person with some money, instead of using that money for herself, she was giving it away to payroll this big ministry of Jesus. And instead of being someone who hired servants for herself, she was serving Jesus. Even though she had Growing up in a household where she probably never touched a dish in her life, probably never had to cook for herself in her life. She was cooking and she was cleaning and she was caring and she was taking care of people who were the forgotten people that Jesus was healing along the way. Every day she woke up with this Jesus and decided to give everything she had for him. But now Mary is standing in a crowd. She's watching that very same Jesus, that Jesus that she loved, be tortured. She's watching that very same Jesus be arrested. So she's fighting back tears as she's, she's standing at the crowd's edge and, and Jesus is, is being tortured and, and whipped and she's standing there and she's fighting back tears both because she's worried and scared that she could be arrested as well and also because there's something in her soul that's screaming, that's jumping out thinking I need to jump into the ring, I've got to defend him, I want to take the whip, I want to take the spit, I want to take the mockery for him, I love him. The soldiers stand Jesus up. They begin to force march him down the road. Mary shuffles along with the crowd. Her soul is just tearing itself into pieces. She's not sure what she should do. She's not even sure what she should feel. But something in her screams, I cannot look away from the cross. Do not look away from the cross. Matthew 27, 32 to 35. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon. And they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now, Mary, she's standing in the crowd. She's seeing this all happen. She's seeing Jesus be treated this way. And she's under no illusion of what's about to happen. She knows where they're headed. They're heading to the hill of Golgotha, the hill of death. Every time for years as she entered Jerusalem for the festivals like every Jew would have, she would have looked up on that hill and seen other victims of this terrible form of execution, this Roman execution, dying and dead, hanging on crosses. She knew what was about to happen to her best friend. They lay Jesus down on a rough wooden cross. They drive nails through his wrists and ankles with every hit of the hammer. There's something within her that forces her eyes to close in agony. Mary lets out a muffled scream as they hoist Jesus up off the ground, the cross snapping in the place. 
She reads this little sign placed above his head on the cross that says, King of the Jews. The Romans who wrote that sign wrote it as a joke, wrote it to laugh at him, but she reads that sign and she thinks, but he is. (laughs) He is king. He's my king. He is the king. There Jesus hangs, suspended by nails, blood rolling down. He's suffocating under his own weight. This form of of execution was invented by the Roman Empire. They knew it was was so horrific that they wouldn't even put their own citizens through it. It was so brutal, it was so barbaric that its only real purpose was to terrify anyone who saw it so they would never cross the empire again. So as many people come into the town for the festivals, as many people walk by, they look away. They look away from this grotesque horror of death, but not Mary. She walks towards the cross and she stands there because she will not look away from the cross. Mark 15, 28 to 32. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, (laughs) you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said. He can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see him and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So Mary's heart man, just flashes with anger as she hears these people mocking Jesus. There's so many of them, and there's just one of her. They're so hateful. She knows she can't do anything. She feels helpless. They cry out, ah, he can't save himself. They're laughing at him. He can't save himself. But she thinks, he saved me. He saved me. Jesus saved me. And then this little voice in the back of her head says, Jesus, Jesus, why don't don't you come down? Why don't you get off the cross? This question runs through her mind. Why is Jesus letting them do this to him? Mary had gotten to see Jesus still storms in the rain, in the wind, just by a word. She had gotten to see Jesus throw demons out of her own body. She had gotten to see Jesus heal people. She had gotten to see Jesus raise the dead back to life. Jesus, why don't you get down from the cross, she thinks. Jesus, why don't you get down from the cross and show these people who's boss, but there he hangs. Over the last years, Mary has seen Jesus every single day. And there was no one like him. To sit with Jesus was to sit in God's presence, and she knew it. To get to listen to Jesus was to listen to the voice of God, and she knew it. She had been following him for years, hundreds of days, and every day she followed him, oh, she never felt alone. There had been so many lonely days before she had met him, but now she had never felt alone in years. But this day, as she watches her Savior be hung on the cross, she feels alone, lonely. So her eyes, her eyes scan the crowd for a friend. Someone to comfort her loneliness. Where are the disciples, she thinks. Where's where's Peter? I don't don't see him. Where's Thomas? Where's Andrew? She shakes her head in lonely disbelief. What she doesn't know is that nearly all of the disciples have abandoned Jesus, run away at his arrest. They were scared for their lives. They could not bring themselves to watch their friend be put to death on the cross. But she refuses to look away. She refuses. You see, on the day where Jesus needed them most, most of his friends abandoned him and looked away from him. But Mary wouldn't. She refuses to look away from the cross. 
John 19, 25 to 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby and said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple, the one writing, took her into his home. So yes, all, all three of the women who were standing at the foot of, cross, of the cross that day were all named Mary, just to keep it a little confusing. And I always love this scene because this is like the last moments of Jesus' life. The last moments he's alive, and he takes this last minute, this last breath to be able to take care of his mother Like it just speaks to his love and his kindness and how human he was that in the last minutes of his death, he looks down at the the cross and he sees his mother and his heart is just torn in two. Because in that day, a a widow as Mary, the mother of Jesus would have been, was reliant on her sons to even provide her with food. And so he looks at his best friend John and he's one of the only disciples who hasn't run away and abandoned him. And he looks at that friend and he says, take care of my mom. And man, it just speaks to me of how much Jesus, it was one of us, one of us humans, just like us, and how much he loved. But of course, here in Scripture, it it goes out of its way to mention Mary Magdalene. There, There would have been dozens of people. There would have been probably hundreds of onlookers at the cross that day that witnessed this death. But Scripture mentions Mary by name. So if you think about that, that means that for all the thousands of years since, all the billions of times people have sat down and read the story of Jesus' death, every single time they have read the name of Mary Magdalene. Scripture took the time to honor her in that way. Wouldn't you like for years to come for heaven to still be honoring you because of what you did for the gospel? It's a tribute to her faith. While so many others abandoned that day, uh, Jesus that day, she would not look away. She wouldn't abandon him. He, she didn't leave him. She would not look away from the cross. Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal, who was just making fun of him too, by the way, rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So, if you have ever felt too unworthy, to find faith in Jesus. If you have ever felt like the wrongs you have done are too much for God's grace to overcome. If you've ever felt like your past is too sketchy to be forgiven by a savior, listen to this man's story. What happens to this man? He hangs dying. He acknowledges that he has done wrong. He turns and has faith and belief in Jesus, this man who was just making fun of Jesus. He has faith in Jesus. And does Jesus turn to him and go, all right, well, make sure you right your wrongs before you die. Oh, oh, oh actually, you know, you, you actually need to do some good stuff to pay for your sketchy past before you come to me and before I will accept you and allow you to believe in me and be saved. No, does that, is that what Jesus says? Does he just say, ooh, I'll forgive you if you figure it out? No. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. This man has no opportunity to right his wrongs, no opportunity to make himself worthy. No. It is all the grace of God. It is all the forgiveness of Jesus that is being provided right in that moment. He has no time to do anything anything and yet he will spend all of eternity with God because he is simply willing to believe. So if this man could get his life right, if he could be made right by God, if he could find salvation right in that last minute of his life, it's not too late for you to believe either. Mark 15, 33 to 41. 
At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near this herd, uh, they said, listen, he's calling out to Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on the staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, they said. So Mary Magdalene, she's been watching her best friend. She's been watching Jesus expire for the last six hours. When suddenly, Jesus cries out in a voice that she hears, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Man, those weird words are, are this, uh, this dark cry that, that haunted everyone that day. That would have haunted Mary as she heard them. That haunt us still to this day. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What does Jesus mean in this moment? We'll remember what is happening. Jesus is taking the weight of all of our sin, all of the sin ever created, all of the sin ever that you have done and I have done. He's taking it, and he's taking it as a weight upon his shoulders, and he is dying to forgive it. Now, what is it that separates us from God? Well, it's our sin, right? Our God is a perfect God, and we are imperfect. God is not around. He does not tolerate. He does not associate himself with sin because he is a perfect God. And so sin separates us from God. And so in this moment, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and all of that sin is on him. And so the Father actually separates himself for just a moment. It is something that Jesus had never experienced and that he would never experience again. And it's my humble opinion that it was the greatest pain ever experienced by a human in history. Being separated from his father. John 19, 31 to 37. And that was the day of preparation and the next day was going to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the, the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear Bringing a sudden flow of, of blood and water, the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. So the religious leaders and the soldiers, they get impatient. It took a long time to die on the cross because you didn't actually die on a cross of your wounds on your hands and your feet. You died by suffocating very slowly. It's been going on for hours, and they've had enough. And so they go around and they begin to, to break the legs of, of the other criminals so that they cannot hold themselves up and get a breath. But when they come to Jesus, they recognize that he is already dead. And so to verify his death, they prod him with a spear. From the wound comes both blood and water. Blood and water. Why? Well, blood because this represents the sacrifice of Jesus. In the temple, there were sacrifices made on an ongoing basis. Ever since the first uh, uh, temple had been built, centuries before by King Solomon, and there are these animals that would come to the temple and people would give these animals to be sacrificed by the priest and it was the blood of the animal running down the altar that would forgive the people of their sins. Their sins would be placed upon this animal and it was the blood, the life, blood that would forgive them of their sins. So blood comes from this wound of Jesus as a way of reminding you that you are forgiven. There has been a once for all sacrifice made through Jesus' blood. 
But then also water comes out. Why water? Well, water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so it's this symbol of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon God's people. Why water is a symbol of the Spirit? Well, remember in the second verse of the entire Bible back in the book of Genesis, how do you see the Holy Spirit? He's hovering above the waters, right? And then Isaiah 44, there's this prophecy where God promises that when the Messiah comes, when God comes again to give redemption, that he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit on his people like water, watering and pouring over a thirsty land. And so as Jesus is prodded with this spear, it's all coming true. Luke 23 46 to 49, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all, these, when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what had taken place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching watching, watching these things. So as Jesus dies, there's this one particular centurion that's a a leader in the, the, the Roman army who recognizes that Jesus, the same Jesus that he just inflicted death upon, was innocent of the crimes that he was accused of. He recognizes that he did wrong, and he's not alone. Thousands of people were packed into Jerusalem this uh, Passover festival. So plenty of curious onlookers who had gone to Golgotha to, to watch this famous teacher named Jesus be put to death. Well, some of them beat their chests, lamenting his death, recognizing that it was wrong. But still, they just walk away. They walk away from the cross. But notice who stays. The text tells us that it was the women who followed him from Galilee. That includes Mary Magdalene. Magdala, the town she was from, was right on the Sea of Galilee. And what is she doing? Well, verse 49 specifically tells us she was watching. She was watching these things. She would not look away from the cross. Matthew 27, 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. So this moment that Jesus dies in the temple, the curtain, the curtain that was so thick, it tears in two. Now this symbolized a few things. One thing it symbolized was it was at the temple where all of those animal sacrifices took place. And by destroying this curtain, you undermine the, the temple's power and Jesus, God, is showing that that temple system is no longer necessary You no longer need these sacrifices because Jesus has provided the sacrifice needed to forgive sins forever for those who believe in him. But then also, it symbolizes something incredible. So the temple was arranged as this big building, and in the the back of the building, in this smaller place, was the Holy of Holies. And for centuries, that was the place where all of Israel saw God as living the place where heaven touched earth, the place where you could go and access God and experience God. It was the place where God's presence was so intense, and yet God had placed a curtain so you couldn't get there. And that curtain was saying, because of your sin, you cannot come in. This is my presence in the Holy of Holies. Here you are out here, sinful. You've done wrong. You are not perfect as I am. And so I have to place a curtain to separate you and me. That's what God was saying with that curtain. You cannot access me. You cannot experience my presence in this place. And now when Jesus dies, what happened? Oh, that curtain's torn in two. And it's God's way of saying, now that I've taken care of your sin, you can come in. Now that I've taken on your wrongs, you can come in. You can experience me. You can access me. You can know my presence through Jesus. So the curtain is torn in the temple. It's torn. Matthew 
27, verses 51 to 54. That moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split. The tombs broke open. Get this. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city, and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. So put yourself in Mary's shoes. She's standing there and she's just seen Jesus die and now she feels the earth begin to quake and move underneath her. She hears the rocks split, likely the rocks on the hills around the temple mount. And as if that's not overwhelming enough, it goes dark. If that's not overwhelming enough, she starts to see the dead walking through the streets of Jerusalem. Now, why in the world did God do that? <laughs> why did for a moment God resurrect just a few people in Israel and have the walking dead head through the streets of Jerusalem? Well, here's why. Raising the dead to life with a, with a fulfillment of a prophecy that God had made back in Ezekiel 37, that when the Messiah came, this would happen, the dead would rise. But it's also not just a past prophecy, it's a foretaste of a future promise that when Jesus returns again, he will resurrect all people. The belief in Jesus that Mary Magdalene has held in her heart for years is now unignorable in the physical world, right? I mean, she has followed Jesus, and all these people are trying to ignore who he really is. They're trying to pretend like he's something else. But now the moment he dies, it all goes to dark. The dead are walking. There's an earthquake. You can't miss it. It's unignorable. Have you ever been through one of those moments? where the belief that you hold in Christ in your heart suddenly jumps into the physical world in an unignorable way. Frankly, I'm experiencing one of those this morning. I've prayed for our church to have its own building for years, and here we are. It's unignorable. You've probably been through this. What Mary is going through in this moment is when you've been praying for something for months and for years, and then suddenly you see it in the real world. You're giving the amazing privilege of watching God work in an unignorable way, in a way that everyone can see. Mary Magdalene saw God move. Why? Because she refused to look away from the cross. Mark 15 Verses 40 to 41. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were who? Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of James, the younger of, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these, in Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. So three out of the four gospel stories all end in the exact same way by mentioning that Mary Magdalene was still there at the cross. When everybody else had ignored him and, and run from him and abandoned him, three out of the four gospels mention her by name, that she did not run away, she did not look away from her Savior. Mary Magdalene and the other women, Mary was recorded for all time as the most important witness to Jesus' death. Why does she get that honor? Because she wouldn't look away from the cross. But this begs the question, where in the world is everybody else? Right? Like, where, where's Peter? Peter was the guy who was supposed to be in charge of all the disciples. Where's Peter? Well, he looked away when he had denied Jesus three times uh, the night of Jesus' arrest. Where are the rest of the disciples? We only hear about John here. Where are the other guys? There were 12 of them. Well, they looked away when they were scared that they too would be arrested and put to death. They ran away. Where, where were the hundreds and hundreds of people who were following Jesus through the countryside? Remember all those stories of people coming out to hear him? Where's all those people? Well, they had looked away for Jesus months before when he started publicly declaring himself as Messiah and God. 
So all these other people, they had abandoned him. They had run away from him. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus. They were ashamed of him. They looked away from him, but not Mary. She would not look away from the cross. And this is the simple message, the only message, the one message that I want to leave you with this week of Holy Week. As we look forward to Good Friday, death, do not look away from the cross. Do not look away from the cross. This is the one week, the one week that we have to sit and contemplate what happened that week so many years ago as Jesus, Jesus went to the cross to die for us to forgive us of our sins, to put things right with us and God. Take just this one week. Think about it. Contemplate it. Let it wrestle around in your soul every day that he died for you. Do not look away from the cross. And look, you're going to be so tempted. I get it. I get it. I love Easter too. You're going to be so tempted to jump over the cross on the way to the empty tomb to get right to Easter, to start celebrating. But wait. Let your soul hang in that tension of having to contemplate what Jesus did for you, the cost that he paid for you, this story of what he has done for you. Don't jump over the cross on your way to the empty tomb. Don't don't ignore Jesus' death so you can begin to celebrate his resurrection a little early. Do not. Do not look away from the cross. And so this morning as we contemplate the cross, there is no better Sunday to come to the table, to come to communion. Because you see, before Jesus was put to death, that night he was arrested, that very night he shared that last supper with his disciples. So that night, you know, before he goes to the cross, he, he, he gets all his guys together. He gets all his friends together. Mary was there too, right? He gets them all together. And before they start eating, Jesus is, as they're beginning to pass around some of the food, he, he said this, When he had given thanks, he he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance, remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, in the context of having just read the story of the cross, think about that. He's just hours away from being arrested. Not long away from being put to death. And it's right in that moment he calls together his disciples and he's like, keep doing this. Like keep, you got to remember what I'm about to do. But like, you, you're, you're about to abandon me. I, I get it. But I'm about to go die for you. And, and my body's going to be broken and my blood's going to be shed for you so I can forgive you. And one of the ways you're going to remember this, that you can't do it alone, that you can't do it without my blood, is that you're going to come to the table. You're going to come and you're going to take bread. And you're going to take the cup. And that bread is going to remind you of my body, the flesh that hung on the cross. And that cup is going to remind you of my blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins putting forever aside the sacrifices in the temple because now it's a once-for-all-time sacrifice. So there is no better morning. There is no better day to come to the table than today. I want you to put aside all the cares you have in the world. Even put aside all your individual requests and simply thank God for what he did on the cross. For what he gave for the cost of the cross. And so this morning, we're, we're, we're in a new building, obviously, so uh, communion will look a little different. We're never f- formal about it here. You can stay in your seat to whatever you're ready, to whatever your heart is ready. And you can make it down these middle aisles here. And we've got communion set up in the back of the room for you. You can uh, take a piece of the bread, 
as Jesus' body and dip it into the cup. And as you partake, you can come back to your seat or you can eat right there and remind yourself this is his body broken, his blood shed for the forgiveness of my sins. Don't look away from the cross. Do not look away from the cross this morning. And allow this time of the table to focus your gaze on what Jesus did for you there. Be like Mary. Don't look away from the cross this morning.